G-bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, right? What does that mean? Why am I telling you G-bombs? Why is it so important to remember G-bombs? Because these are the foods that have been identified in the scientific literature to show dramatic protection against cancer. And a nutritarian diet includes a full portfolio of the full of all those anti-cancer foods so all the bases are filled. So you're covering, checking off every box of the nutrient calcification that slows aging and protects against cancer, right? You know, if there was another category of foods that were powerfully protective against cancer, and there are, like tomatoes, for example, then we should include that in a nutritarian diet too. But the most powerful ones are G-bombs. It's not a diet only of G-bombs, but I want people to recognize that so they can remember to eat the green vegetables every day and remember to try to consume some mushrooms every day, not once a week, mushrooms on a regular basis, almost every day. Because the studies show that people eat mushrooms regularly, almost every day. For example, one study on Asian women showed a 64% lower risk of breast cancer just because they had about 10 grams of mushrooms the size of your thumb on a regular basis, on every day. People who eat beans every day. Beans in the Nurses Health Study in Boston were the food with the most powerful association against breast cancer. That's right. Throw a dart at any of those foods. Take seeds like flax seeds with their lignans. Well, look at the study on, on those lignin-containing seeds, like flax seeds and chia seeds, and sesame seeds too have lignans in by the way. Seeds have lignans in them. They tracked the lignin count in a woman's diet who had breast cancer, and they followed the breast cancer deaths for 10 years. And they found that women who ate a third of one milligram a day of lignin had a 71% reduced risk of dying of breast cancer over that 10-year period. 71% lower risk just from a third of a milligram of lignin, a teaspoon of flax seeds, a teaspoon, by the way, not a tablespoon, a teaspoon has seven milligrams, and these women were only a third of a milligram, and they already had cancer already. Certainly, the younger in life, you, you start things when you're before you get cancer, the more effective they are at protecting you. As you wait till you're near death and you try to put healthy habits then, the effect's gonna be lessened, but even after they got cancer, it still reduced their risk of death tremendously. And they still were taking the wrong dose anyway. What I'm saying to you right now, that the studies show that these foods are dramatically protective against cancer. Each food taken individually, just people who eat onions regularly, have a between a 55 and 88% reduction of most common cancers, just from eating a quarter cup of onion a day. And that's not because they had it with the flax seeds and the mushrooms and the, and the kale and the collard greens. They just had the onion in their diet. What if we designed a diet style that included all these powerful anti-cancer foods on a regular basis? Then what would happen? Well, that's what I'm advising people do. And that's what the Nutritarian Women's Health Study does. We're doing a study at Northern Arizona University where women register for the study and we have thousands of women sign up and they pledge to eat these foods every day and they follow a Nutritarian diet and we're following them for 20 years. We want to show people that we have the knowledge and the ability to wipe out cancer. Not totally wipe it out, because we're not gonna, you know, but, but we can have a, a, almost wipe it out. We could, in other words, we have a tremendous power to save lives here. Tremendous power to save lives. You should be part of that power. This is like giving you superpowers. I'm giving you superpowers. You know what I mean by that? Like, what good are superpowers to fly through the air or to see through cracks ray vision or to bend steel or to do all kinds of crazy things? We're not being invaded by aliens, other aliens with superpowers. Those are no good or worthless. Not totally worthless. But the real superpowers we need are the powers to stop people dying of heart attacks and strokes and cancers all around us. How many people in this room? Let's right here. We'll just check it out, right? Raise your hand if you've been stabbed by a knife in your torso or head, or if a family member has been stabbed by a knife. All right, two people. How about shot by a bullet? Raise your hand. Shot by a bullet, killed by a bullet, family member. Yes, one person. Two people, okay. What's that? No. 
stabbed by a knife during surgery? <laughs> I didn't know that surgeons shot people with bullets. There's an, there's a, there's an orthopedic surgeon here. Are they, sh are they shooting people with bullets? No. All right, look. Now answer the question, if you don't mind. How many of you know people in your family who've either had a heart attack or a stroke or a cancer diagnosis? That's a neighborhood I wouldn't want to live in. And that's a neighborhood you've got to get out of, right? Get out of that neighborhood. Take yourself out immediately, today. Because that's going to make your life miserable. Who wants to get older and be sickly? Is that the golden years? You work all your life? You finally have some money saved up in the bank? You retire? So you can be tortured and suffer? What do they call it? The coal years? And most people that die in America, now, how much money they made and how much money they saved, it's all gone anyway. You know where it went to? Medical care, the end of their life. That's right. Who wants to die in a hospital after being tortured anyway? You can't just die peacefully at home. You've got to be rushed off there so they can torture you for a few weeks or so, take all your money, and then you can die. As opposed, for example, to somebody like, who wrote The Good Life, it's a guy, um, Helen and Scott Nearing. Scott Nearing wrote a book, The Good Life. He was an MIT scholar, right? He showed people by having a house in Maine, he picked Maine because it's a cold climate in the United States. He wanted to show people he can build a little greenhouse and make his own food and be self-sufficient with very little money and be healthy and happy. And he did that. He lived to be 101 years old. At 101 years old, he was getting weak. He couldn't work in the field anymore. He was getting a little tired and fatigued. So he, set up, so he had a big party. I invited all his friends from all over the world. And he said goodbye to everybody in good health. And then in the next couple of months, he fasted himself to death. He didn't want to get away until he got sick. So he just gently, like, but... He lived to be 101. His wife, Helen, died at, I think, 97 in a car accident, actually. But the point is that he died under his own terms in good health at the age of 101. You know what I mean? I'll show you some people. It's just one person. Don't clap. It's not such a big deal. It's just one person. <laughs> but I'll show you lots of my, patient, my nutritarian patients over the years who've been living into the late 90s and 100 in great health, too. So it's not really one person. I can't even get these people to die. Yeah. <laughs>